to uh, what you would imagine the list looking like. It's pretty much stock from Theros with four Bioblades. Yeah. No fuss, no bus. It's just all four of us all the time. And he's playing against Matthew Fireck, who's playing Mono Blue Devotion this year. So thoughts these, you see. A rapid hybridization, a Thassa, a Master Wave, Judge Familiar, two islands, and a Muta Vault. We're playing some old school magic right here. That's what's happening. Is Chung did Mulligan to five this game. And Mulligans are really tough on Mono Black Devotion. They do a lot of trading one for one and lean on Underworld Connections to, to make it all up or to have high impact cards like Desecration Demon. But really hard to play that game plan on five cards. So see Thassa is going to resolve here. I think Thassa is the easy choice. Is it's definitely the best card in Phyrex hand. Master Waves is obviously very good, but it's not very potent in this matchup. Yeah, Mono Black Devotion with a lot of tools to answer Master Waves, but Thassa is almost impossible to remove from play and incredibly powerful. Phyrex with the Judge's Familiar on turn one. That Chung did know about it. He just passed the turn back. Chung draws a card for the turn. I think he drew another copy of Thoughtseize. And he's going to cast that right now in the face of a Judge's Familiar that could sacrifice. You don't see this happen that often. Well, Judge's Familiar is actually pretty good against Mono Black Devotion. They mm -hmm. have a lot of expensive spells, especially Hero's Downfall. Uh, the question here now is, are any of the cards in Phyrex's hand good enough that he really wants to preserve it? You know, he has a Rapid Hybridization that's pretty anemic against an opponent on five cards who's playing Mono Black Devotion. You have a Master of Waves that, you know, may not really amount to much because of all the removal. Mm -hmm. uh, Matthew, uh, Phyrex does determine that it's worth fighting over, but uh, it's close there. That might be an exchange that Chung is very happy with, too, as Phyrex just going to play a Mutavolt and pass the turn back here. So Chung, still looking for a second land, does find one. So here's a Swamp, pass the turn back. And again, Chung on a mulligan to five this game. Fyrek was able to keep his seven, but Thought Seasons are making things a little bit more difficult here. Interesting to see if maybe we see a Mutavolt get fired up this go around. And I feel like it's very hard for Mono Blue Devotion to win the matchup without one of its high impact cards. Of course. Like Thassa, Biden, Jace, something along those lines. Mono Black Devotion can fend off this kind of stuff all day long. Oh, there's a Bile Blight to play the role Stone Rain, but Rapid Hybridization will take care of this. So an exchange of resources that may be favorable there for Chung. Well, with I think Fyrek is happy making these kind of exchanges with Chung on five cards. Sure. Maybe if we were both looking at seven card hands, it would be a little bit different. See Chung Sandra, he's got a Devour Flesh and a Mystery card hanging out over there. So we're going to see our uh, Frog Lizard come in. It's been a minute since I've had Rapid Hybridization show up. But once that 3-3 comes into play, that's going to be Fyrek's turn. And I believe he does have quite a few lands in his hand. So he's okay with this Stone Rain interactions taking place, it seems. We've spoken about this a little bit on the broadcast. You know, Mono Blue Devotion versus Do You Splash White. I think Rabbit Hybridization is so good in this deck that I believe it's worth staying at staying Mono Blue for this card alone. As usually, if you're adding Detention Sphere to, to the deck, it necessitates moving, removing copies of Rabbit Hybridization. Another copy of Bio Blight drawn here for Chung. Just going to pass the turn back. His fire is going to draw a card. Looks like he may have just peeled off a Thassa. Here's an attack for three. Looks like a removal spell. There's a Bio Blight. And with Chung with no pressure and just removal spells in hand, this is about as good of a board for Thassa as it gets. Yeah. So there is the God of the Sea, and that's going to be the one that may spell doom here for Chung. As it's not going to, you know, come firing in for five damage right away, but it'll ensure that Fire Red actually draws a good card every single turn and eventually get to him. Yeah, it's not about this turn. It's about three or four turns mm -hmm. down the line. Does a really nice job of setting the stage. As you see, Fyrek is going to start this turn by scrying. He'll keep that card. Obviously happy with what he saw on top of his deck. There's an island. This is a Biden to Thassa. Now he's working his devotion count up. Yeah, and this is a great play by Fyrek here, as now any double blue spell threatens a lot. Turns on Thassa, he gets a draw card, potentially. Fire taking a look at the top card of his deck. He's happy with it yet again. And we know he has Master of Waves. Not sure the other card. He has an island hiding out there as well, but he's got three cards. There's an island. Let's see what the Mono Blue Devotion player wants to do. Mono Blue Devotion sitting at 6 0. A little bit of a surprise here. All the different decks in the farm. We haven't seen Mono Blue dominate very much recently. I think this is going to be a Nightfall Spectre, and it is. We're going to see Mutavolt get fired up as well. And now, the combination of Bident and Thassa are going to start to take over this game. Yeah, it just puts so much pressure on Chung to answer everything the second game that comes into mm -hmm. play. And being on a mulligan to five is obviously tough enough, but this is where things get really hairy. Yeah, the proactive sources of card advantage are the most critical piece for Mono Blue in the matchup, and now Fyrek has all that he could really ask for. 
And you see Chung does have a copy of Devour Flesh, also has a Biden Blight, or Bile Blight, excuse me, in his hand. But again, you know, he can make some exchanges here, but none of them are great. That's the problem. You know, he can Bile Blight, Nightfill Spectre. Sure, that turns off Thassa, but Mutavol gets to get in, draw, my, draw him a card, you know, things like that. It's just the exchanges are never going to be great here for Chung. Yeah, and I think he was, Chung was deliberating here, do I take this hit, do I Bile Blight something, and then try to use the Edict next turn, but... Uh, he just can't allow Fire to be drawing cards here. He needs yeah. to use his removal right now. Devour Flesh is going to take care of the Mutavolve. Fire will gain two life from that. But that means Thassa is going to be able to crash in. Deal Chung five. The Biden will trigger, drawing a card. And Fire will confidently pass the turn back as Chung will draw a card. It's a copy of Hero's Downfall. And all Chung can do is just pass the turn back yet again. As Fyrek is going to start his turn by scrying with Thassa. That card's going to go to the bottom, which means a mystery card is coming. It's just so hard for Sean to keep Fyrek off of all of his tools at this point. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is part of the reason that Bind Thassa is so good in this deck, too. It's not a card that you can play a ton of because it's a legendary, but, you know, when you do draw one, especially in this matchup, it plays a huge role. So he's going to come across with both creatures here. There's three mana. This is a hero's downfall targeting Nightfall Spectre. That'll get the job done. That'll also remove Thassa from combat because Devotion is not satisfied. But the follow-up obviously is a good one. It's a Master of Waves. That Fire has had since the beginning of the game. You do your Devotion count. That's four. So now four two one elementals will come into play, and Fire can pass the turn back. I believe that Fire had a Nightfall Spectre in his hand that he could have played as insurance before combat to make sure that Thassa remained uh, with the Devotion count sufficient. Yep. But this is something that's changed now in the face of Bile Blight. It would have been really bad for Fyrek to run a second Night Veil Spectre out there. Yeah, So pretty true. heads up play there. Uh, it, I understand the temptation of trying to ensure that Thassa gets to connect, but Fyrek's way more concerned about just keeping all of his individual pieces. So it's time to scry yet again. And while Bile Blight can't take care of Master of Waves, and then obviously that takes care of the elemental tokens, I'm, I'm in agreement with you that if you do play Night Veil Spectre, you get blown up pretty badly by a Bile Blight, especially when your opponent's on a mulligan to five. You don't want to walk in any two-for-ones that are working in their favor. And you see, you know, Fyrek again had Master of Waves in his hand that he drew this turn. Before Born of the Gods, the instinct there would be to play it before combat as insurance. But yep. he's holding it off. He knows that Chung basically has to kill Master of Waves to have any shot of staying in this game. One of the ways that he has to kill it is Bio Blight, and so he's being... Fyrek is being appropriately conservative with how he's deploying his threats. There's Bob Blight number three, going to take care of Master Waves and the Elemental Tokens, but because Nightfall Spectre came pre-combat, means Thassa's is still alive, which means it'll come across for five, trigger the Biden, draw a card, Fire can pass the turn back after playing the Mutavolt, and again, just really working away at Chung. He doesn't have to do it quickly because he's not underneath any pressure. Yeah. That's the big thing here, is that he can just take his time working down these resources because, again, he's not underneath any pressure from a Desecration Demon or an Eiffel Spectre or anything like that, and Chung will eventually succumb, which he does do. So, Matthew Fyrek is going to win game number one, Mono Blue Devotion up a game over Mono Black Devotion, off of the back of one, a mulligan, but two, Thassa and her Biden. Yeah, and I think that Fyrek did a really good job of navigating that game. Of course, he had a huge edge with his opponent mulligan to five, but he showed a lot of discipline playing around Bioblight, could have tried to leverage his resources much faster, but knew he had some inevitability there because of his Biden and because of Thassa, and had a card advantage edge already because of the mulligan, and just made sure he didn't get blown out by Bioblight at any point. I think really heads up navigation of that game. We'll take a look at the sideboards here. We're going to start with Matthew Chung on the left as he's going to be on the play of this game. Three Lifebane Zombie, three Duress, two Erebos God of the Dead, two Dark Betrayal, two Drown and Sorrow, two Doomblade, and one copy of Devour Flesh. We see Lifebane Zombie coming in this matchup. I never I think of that card against Bondable Devotion. I think of Owen Turtonwald boarding, in, boarding it in Excuse me, against Sam Pardee in the finals of Grand Prix Albuquerque. The fact that it just provides information and just a 3-1 unblockable creature is worth it. So you can see those coming in. Um... Two copies of Drown and Sorrow in this matchup. We're going to get to those in a second. Doomblade definitely going to come in. Devour Flesh, probably not. But how do you feel about Drown and Sorrow here? Well, I like it, and it certainly as a card, if you could have it in your deck in game one, would do a lot of good work against Mono Blue Devotion. I believe because the Mono Blue Devotion deck post board is often setting out some number of small creatures anyway to go longer with things like Biden and Jace, potentially even Aetherling, means it's much more poorly suited to the way the games play out post board. Okay. You know, it's most likely, you know, Fyrek might be getting rid of things like, you know, his Judge's Familiars and his Tide Binder Mages, in part because he wants high under, higher impact cards, and also in part because Drown and Sorrow is something that's potentially on his radar. So, uh, again, if you could 
magically have it appear in your deck game one, I think it would overall do good work, but less so in the post-board games. Any chance you'd like to rest, or are you okay with just having four thought seasons and going forward? Because they are going to board in a lot of spells to try to beat you. Quite frankly, I'm not even sure how much I like the discard spells. Okay. I think that the Mono Blue Devotion deck is pretty redundant post-board in the things it's trying to do. It has a lot more chases. It has more Bidens if it wants, that sort of thing, and so on and so forth. So it's much harder to just attack the one critical piece with a discard spell. The two life definitely matters as they're de they're beating you down, uh, and they are dead draws later on in the game after the mono blue decks d deployed all of its relevant cards. So I know a lot of people leave in Thoughtseize. I've always felt that it's underperformed in this matchup, and I certainly wouldn't want to go to Duress as well. Okay. How about on the mono blue side? Two Jace, Archetype of Thought, two Aetherling, and a Gate, a Dissolve, four Gainsay, a Curse of the Swine, two Domestications, a Claustrophobia, and a Sensory Deprivation. So I do like the extra Jaces. I think that Aetherling is also legitimate to bring in in this matchup because the games are going to go pretty long. If, if Chung's executing his game plan, he's killing a lot of stuff and, and dragging the game out. Uh, I think the one copy of Dissolve is reasonable here. A lot of good four and five mana spells out of the Mono Blue Black Devotion deck. Nothing else I would really be in the market for. The Jaces, the Aethlings, and the one Dissolve. Possibly the Negate as well, because the Mono Black Devotion deck has a lot of critical spells. It's been a little while since I've actually seen this matchup in action, especially post Born of the Gods. It's something that obviously we saw a lot pre Born of the Gods, but it's been a minute since we've seen this, and oftentimes it felt like it would go three games, and Mono Black Devotion would oftentimes come out on top. Sometimes, you know, it seems like one game they would win solely off of Pack Rat. Yeah. And then, you know, they would figure out a way to win another game, but, you know, one game they would kind of get browbeaten by a Biden to Nathasa and some other stuff. But at the end of the day, at the third game, the Mono Black deck would win. They would move on with their lives. Yeah, and this is the matchup that really warranted a lot of people moving away from a strict Mono Blue shell and adding white because Detention Sphere is such a great answer. To Pack Rat, the Black Devotion deck can't really blow up a Detention Sphere outside of something like a sideboarded Ratchet Bomb or mm -hmm. what have you. Pack Rat is by a mile their best card in the matchup, and so having a very good answer to it uh, is really valuable for Mono Blue Devotion. Well, Matthew Chung, he's going to try and start by keeping seven cards. That's, I think, step number one here, as he had a mulligan of five. And he's on the play this game against Firek, and he's going to keep. Firek will take a look here. Both these players sitting at 6 and 0. They're good to go, and we are underway in game number two. Here's a swamp, and passing it back. We'll see if Firek has something to do on his first turn. Just an island and passing back. So, no judges familiar with Cloudfin Raptor, as Chung does draw a copy of Underworld Connections, which is an interesting card in this matchup because the card drawing it provides is, op is obviously pretty good, but when you're playing against an aggressive deck like Mono Blue Devotion, it's difficult to be able to take time to take that turn off. Yeah, it is, it is tough, but, you know, he's setting into a lot more two-mana removal, so he'll probably get, at least on the play, an opportunity to play it on a fairly empty board. And because his deck is flushed with so much removal, just, you can play a game plan of just drawing two cards a turn, just having a bunch of removal spells and trying to win the game that way. Biden puts a lot of pressure on you to find a, a bunch of removal spells because any threat that slips through the cracks now represents a huge upside for the Blue Devotion player. Looks like a Tidebinder Mage in Firex hand. He's considering casting it or maybe holding back with, you know, his counter magic bluffing, who knows. But he's going to play the Tidebinder Mage and pass the turn back to Chung. We'll see if he has a removal spell. Allowing the Black Devotion deck to curve efficiently with its removal spells is pretty bad here, but uh, that Tidebinder Mage is certainly not getting any better, so uh -huh. might as well cast it. It's probably just going to die, but maybe it doesn't. Fireflesh does take care of that. You see two copies of Neural Connections here in Chung's hand. He did draw a pack for the turn, but he will deploy the enchantment on his swamp before passing the turn back. So Fireflesh going to draw a card. We'll see if we get a good look at his hand and figure out what maybe he wanted to wait for. But he's going to play his source of card advantage, or this card manipulation here in Thassa. Yeah. A really powerful card quality tool. Chung going to draw a card here, going to go down 19 to do, so I do not think he has a fourth land to play, but he did just draw one Temple of Deceit, and bonus, he gets to scry. Keeps the card on top very quickly, and can deploy a pack rat right now if he'd like, and, and he will. And the previous turn, Chung had the opportunity to play pack rat instead of the Underworld Connections, and that gave, you know, that that was a turn off that allowed Fyrek to deploy Thassa. Mm -hmm. Were he to play pack rat, it's possible Thassa couldn't have been cast last turn. Sure. This is a domestication. Oh. That'll be taking a pack rat. Now, Thassa isn't on yet, but it's getting close now because Fire has a devotion of three. Chung's going to untap. He kept his card on top very quickly. It was a land. And domestication's a sweet card to bring in here because if no matter what three drop the Black Devotion deck is playing, whether it's Lifebane, Zombie, or Nightbale Spectre, 
you can still just take it with domestication. Yeah. And spots like this where you get a lone pack rat in play is, is of course, excellent, too. There's Bob Light making it so that Firecast uses his own rule spell on basically his own creature in the pack rat. But he is killing the domestication, which slows down Thoss a little bit. Plays a replacement pack rat before passing the turn back over to Fire Rat, who's going to scry now. And he has to Bio Blight now because he can't Bio Blight that pack rat later once he has his own pack rat in yeah. play. See, Fire consulting his hand, seeing what he wants to do here with this. Chung at the ready to activate Underworld Connections on Fire XN stuff. But we got to get there first, and we'll see what it's going to take to get there. Looks like we're going to see a rapid hybridization take care of Pack Rat. And like I said, this is the upside of adding white. Detention Sphere, of course, would be much better than giving Chung a free 3 3. Yeah. Now there's a claustrophobia. So Chung getting cards out of his hand. But he wants to make sure that Thassa can get closer to turning on as Chung is going to activate this Underworld Connections. I really like the angle that Fyrick's taking here. I haven't seen it out of a lot of Blue Devotion players, but signing in a lot of enchantments is a great way to produce a stable source of devotion. Mm -hmm. uh, because, of course, your creatures are all susceptible to being killed, but your enchantments are pretty stable. It's time for a thought, Seize. Let's see what Fyrick is working with here. He's got a... Wow, he's got a lot of removal. Two copies of Rapid Hybridizations and then a Biden. And yeah, that thing's got to go. And the big question here, Patrick, is was it worth it to cast Rapid Hybridization to take care of Pack Rat instead of dropping Biden down? Uh, I, I think he has to. I, I mean, I don't think you can afford, really afford to give Chung two 3-3s three if you're going to use two copies of Rapid Hybridization, nor can Fyrick allow Pack Rat to simply go unchecked because the Blue Devotion deck doesn't have much of an out to that. Chung going to draw a card with Underworld Connections, goes down to 15. There's a Night Veil Spectre, pretty good draw there. Allows him to use all of his mana if he'd like to. It's a little bit risky to cast, though. Yeah, he does know that domestication is a thing, and that would be a disaster if this night veil got stolen. So, yeah. giving him some score, some some source of pause here. I think the upside of because he has a temple of deceit in play, it's it's big, big upside to play the night veil spectre. But Chung, pretty far ahead in this game, erring on the side of caution, just not casting it. Thoss is going to put the top card to the bottom, so Fire will take a draw. Again, we know he has two copies of rapid hybridization. He lost his bind of Thoss the last turn, so we'll see what he picked up, if anything. And it's not anything, so he's just going to pass the turn back. So let's see what Chung wants to do here. I think Chung is being appropriately conservative. Yeah. He has Bob Blight in his hand. He could have Bob Blighted his own Frog Lizard token. He get Claustrophobia off the board to move Fyrick that much farther away from Devotion. I think that's what he considered, but he's not going to make just yet. Yeah, he can do that whenever he wants to. So there's no big rush. And it's possible the game moves into a place where, you know, Fyrick ends up using a rapid hybridization on his own creature, and then you get to kill another frog that way. So, uh, good patience. Fyrick just drew a land last turn. So, the hand now is just the island and the rapid hybridization. Chunk can uh, definitely navigate this appropriately now that he knows what's up. He's going to play Nightfail Spectre and just pass the turn back. You see his hand for Chunk. He does have two copies of the World Connections. They're not great in multiples. They do facilitate Grey Merchant, of course, but I think one is probably all that he's going to need, which he has online and has, had, and has had, excuse me, for a while now. Yeah, I'm sure he'll cast the second one when he has nothing else to do with his mana. Yeah. But there's no big rush to get the second one in play, so yeah. he's going to use his mana playing removal spells or casting creatures, and he'll throw it into play when he gets around to it, but there's no big rush. Rapid hybridization on Fire Extend step. Going to take care of the Frog Lizard. It's time to scry. Going to go to the bottom. Take a draw. Looks like he actually cast that on his upkeep. Okay. It was going to be on his end turn. A little bit of missequencing there, but we're all good to go. And this is a Master of Waves. Devotion check is four. Two from Claustrophobia, one from Thassa, one from Master of Waves itself. So four, two, one elemental tokens will come into play. I'm not an enormous fan of Master of Waves in this matchup. I just feel... The odds that the Black Devotion deck has no answer to it is fairly low. It increases your exposure to a lot of different removal spells, especially now that Drown and Sorrow is a thing that your opponent could potentially be bringing. Yeah, I was going to say with the induction, in, with the introduction of Bio Blight, I like it even less, but Drown and Sorrow is another reason to like it less. Yeah. And there is Bio Blight to take care of Master of Waves right now. Now Chung can come across for three, put Fyrick down to 19. It's going to be interesting to see if Fyra can chase down what this Underworld Connections is doing for in this game for Chung because it's playing a huge role. Yeah. This is the difference between scrying and drawing cards. It's just extra removal. There's not a lot that 
Fire can actually do with additional card quality because he's so light on total resources. Mm -hmm. Arturo does resolve the scry. Now he's just playing with no cards in his hand and hoping the top of the deck will help him out. Obviously, it didn't help him out that turn. All he can do is pass the turn back here. So Chunk's going to go down to 11. He'll draw a card. It's a Swamp. But he's getting deeper into his deck as he draws a card for his turn. That is Devour Flesh. Nice little interaction here. He can target himself with Devour Flesh to get the Claustrophobia off the table to keep Firek even farther away from Devotion. As he does activate Underworld Connections to the main phase, draws a copy of Munifold. Yeah, all these removal spells are going to be very challenging for, for Firex to slug through. It's going to be very difficult for him to overcome that, as you do see Chung going to attack here for three, going to put Firex down to 16. And you can really see the the issue that Pack Rat causes in the matchup, even when Pack Rat isn't involved in the winning the game, it forces Firex to keep in so many copies of Rapid Hybridization to protect himself. and. He needs a lot of threats to overwhelm Chung's removal. Mm -hmm. So uh, even when Pack Rat isn't winning the game, it's still participating in winning the game. Yeah, that's just that, that, that you have to answer. And you know, as you mentioned, this is part of the reason that people play the other version of this deck with white th for detention sphere. You see Frostborn where it's going to come down here. This is Devour Flesh. You see Chung knows the interaction right away, I believe, of target myself and not you. We'll see. I want to obviously confirm. Yeah, and he, that's exactly what he's going to do. He says, target myself. I'm going to get three life. Thank you very much. Also, claustrophobia is off the table, so you've got to work even harder towards getting devotion. And three life is something that, that Chung is in the market for here. He's taking a lot of shots off his own normal connections. He's falling a little on the low side, so. He's going to take another shot, go down to 12 here, draw a copy of Grey Merchant. Well, that elevator is going to be going back up in a minute. Right. Chung takes a draw. It's a copy of Mutavolt. Really, really, really like the way Matthew Chung has played this game. Yeah, this has been very skillfully navigated. Uh, the one turn that he held up on casting the Night Veil Spectre, I don't know if it was necessarily motivated by the domestication he saw, but I think that was really good discipline. He Me had too. a big edge just from the Underworld connections and being under no pressure, so no reason to risk something stupid happening. Yeah. And now he's just kind of figuring out how he's going to you know, pick the last few wings off of this fly here. Yeah, just closing windows at this yeah. point. I mean, he's got a card drawing engine. You know, he can obviously fire at Mutavolts. He's got Grey Merchant. There's a lot of different things he can do. He can play Heroes Downfall right now, get rid of that Frostburn Weird, which he does do, which allows the Frog Lizard from Rabbit Hybridization to come into the red zone. So, again, as you mentioned, just a lot of options. He's going to fire at Mutavolt now, too, and come across here for five. Going to put Fyrick down to 11. Could play Knife Elf Spectre now if he wants to, or he can just leave up Underworld Connections to draw a couple of cards. It looks like he's going to go with this. Oh, he's going to go with the other connections, okay, and, and really set up for just a huge, huge Grey Merchant. Yeah. I mean, Firek has to know about it now, essentially, at this point, as there's no way he would have cast another Underworld Connections in lieu of using his two in play yeah. if he wasn't trying to do something Devotion-related. Mashra is going to come down, going to put two tokens into play. His devotion count, of course, is at 2, 1 from Thassa, 1 from the Master itself. Chunk's going to untap all those lands. He'll take a draw. It's a Temple of Deceit. But for him, it feels like we're probably on the Fireball plan now. I would imagine. He may want to look at some cards with under Underworld Connections first. Get As some a, more information. Well, you know, if you find a removal spell for Master of Waste, that makes it really convenient. Yeah. Because then you get to attack with Mutavolts and then finish off the game for sure next turn with your Grey Merchant. Well, you're going to start off with Temple of Deceit. Go scrying that way. Can influence his Underworld Connection activations. Yeah. Looks like he kept that card on top. And now he's going to draw a card, so... Might be the rule spell that you mentioned. That's a Bio Blight. Yeah. I like this, you know. No reason to just slam the Grey Merchant into play when it's not lethal. So there is Bio Blight. Get the Master in. It's Waves out of here. In 4-3. Push down to eight. I think it conveniently has five mana available to cast a Grey Merchant for an eight-point Fireball. Exactly enough mana and exactly enough devotion. That's weird. Easy. He must have gotten lucky. Yeah, I got pretty <laughs> lucky. <laughs> Matthew Chung going to win game number two as we work our way through round number seven of our standard open. We'll be playing a third one here between Mono Blue and Mono Black Devotion. Kind of old school. A throwback to a few months ago where this was these two decks were the thing that was going on. Yes. I still think you can argue, uh, man, Mono Blue, I guess it just hasn't really... Uh, 
hasn't really been the thing to be doing. Mono Black's still perfectly fine. We see a lot more Orzhov mid-range, I think, than Mono Black Devotion nowadays, but obviously still the archetype is a winning one. Yeah, and I actually think Mono Blue Devotion is poised for an uptick now that uh, we're having all these successful burn strategies and Mono Red is making a comeback of sorts. The Mono Blue Devotion matchup is a nightmare for those two decks in my experience. Yeah, I think Mono, Mono Blue Devotion is kind of the fun police for Mono Red. Yeah, I mean, even setting aside just Master Waves, the structure of their deck, they're really good at blocking. You really don't have ways to remove Thassa once it's in play, uh, unless you use Chain of the Rocks, in which case Thassa probably hit you once. Uh, it's tough to beat them. You're also really good against Chandra's Phoenix, which I feel like a lot of decks aren't very good yeah. against right now. You know, you've got Nightfail Spectre, you've got Cloudfin Raptor, even Judges from there just on chump blocking duty for a turn. And Rapid Hybridization is extremely powerful, too. Yeah. You know, you have spots where you're trying to War Leader's Helix their guy. That's your entire turn. You need the life gain. It gets hit with Rapid Hybridization. You don't gain life. They have a 3-3 three, three in play now. There's, you know, if you're playing a Mono Red Beatdown deck, both Two drops, Frostburn, Weird, and Tide Binder Mage are very good against you. Yep. Master of Waves is game over, even with no other blue card in play a lot of the time. <laughs> so uh, I think Blue Devotion is, is a deck that's... I, I would imagine it's going to gain an uptick in popularity in the coming weeks. Might be a big player in the Invitational next weekend. Yeah, I mean, I know there are a lot of people who are playing in the Invitational. You know, you think of Brian Brondwin, um, Huey Jensen, some of the other players who are obviously going to be going there. Big fan of Esper right now. Brad Nelson, too. But... You know, if, if that's the case, Mono Blue Devotion doesn't look so good. But if people are trying different things, moving in different directions, you got to really like where Mono Blue's positioned. And this could be a weekend where it kind of sets the stage for next weekend as far as Mono Blue's concerned. I mean, Mono Blue Devotion did a lot of work to suppress other decks in the format prior to uh, Born of the Gods being released. That's true. It, you know, it's hateful towards a lot of strategies. Well, we know at least one player is doing well with it, Matthew Fyrek. I know that Nathan Holiday. we obviously had him on camera a little bit earlier. We saw him win a pretty easy game. Um, saw him moving uh, moving forward with the match slip after this round. So he had a draw. I think he might be sitting in X01 territory still. Sure. Could be looking at potentially several copies of Mono Blue Devotion in the top eight. Do you like Mastering Waves? I mean, I like it. It's a sweet design. I wish it wasn't so good against the decks I play, but that's okay. <laughs> it's got to be something, you know? As a red mage, what is your least favorite card to play against over the history? Probably Core Firewalker? Yeah, well, it's. It, I answer this question two different ways. If we're actually looking at what's the most egregious hate card, it, you know, Core Firewalker is really high on the list. Chill is, is really high on the list. Circle Protection Red is quite high on the <laughs> list. But... I actually say that I'm more aggravated by playing against Kitchen Things. Okay. Because I feel like when my opponent plays a Core Firewalker or a Chill, my reaction is, okay, this sucks and I lose, but this person wanted to win this matchup. They thought about this, and they put these cards in their sideboard to win here. Okay. So good for them. You okay. know, they're being rewarded. Kitchen Things is just totally insane against any number of opponents, and it's a total freebie to put in your deck X4. And sure. I lose that card all the time, you know? So I would, I would say I'm actually far more frustrated by Kitchen Finks than any of the more explicitly anti-red hate cards. Is there a, like, anti-red hate card that you enjoyed playing against because you knew it was not good enough to beat you? Birds and Forge Tender. I, I was actually going to say that. Yeah, Birds That is and, insane. I was yeah. actually going to say that. It never, ever beat a red deck. Yeah, it's fine or whatever, but if you think that you're winning the matchup before when you were losing, you got, I got bad news. Yeah. It's not going to get the job done, my friends. Yeah. See, both players look at their opening hand. We're underway in game number three. We're going to start off with a Judge's Familiar here for Mr. Fyrek. Chung with a Swamp. Anything cool to do on turn one? He's just going to pass it back. Some removal spells and some Desecration Demons, which is a really good setup for Mono Black Devotion in the matchup, as a fast Desecration Demon is a little rough for Mono Blue. But it looks like Fyrek has the one drop, two drop start. We'll see if he has a three as well. I believe I caught a Tide Binder Mage in his hand. He's going to get his life total ready there off of his pad of paper. But Chung is going to go down to 19. We'll see if Fyrek has a, a uh, turn two play here. It wouldn't surprise me if Fyrek sided into a slightly more aggressive build on the play, as Drown and Sorrow is much less of a concern when he's on the play versus on the draw. I agree. Especially when you have Dredge's familiar to mess things up with the, uh, with the casting cost, having to pay one more. But all of this is predicated on Fyrek finding one of his power cards, whether it's Thassa or Biden of Thassa. As good as this opening is curve-wise, I think that, you know, Chung can easily fend this off with just random Doom Blades and such. Here's an attack for three. Going to put Chung down to 16. And Fyrek actually did draw Thassa for the turn, and he's going to deploy that. So, one, two, three, and happy to pass the turn back is he. 
as Chunk has to draw into Muta Vault. Now, Chunk does have a Doomblade in his hand, but he didn't want that to get countered by Judge's Familiar. So there is Muta Vault. I feel like you got to cast something there, though. He's so far behind on the board, he's getting out-tempoed here. I don't think he can afford to pass. Even though it looks bad to have to Doomblade and Judge's Familiar, I would have cast something there. Okay. Has, uh, has Doomblade, and he also has Bile Blight in the grip. See, Fire going to take a look at the top card here. It's time to scry with Thassa. That card's going to the hand. Looks like a Cloud from Raptor. Looks like he wants to work towards Devotion this turn. Probably looking at multiple spells if he kept a Cloud from Raptor. Yeah, that's what it feels like to me, too. He's going to start by playing Cloud from Raptor, which is going to turn on Thassa, obviously. Devotion is in check now. This is a judgment. That's going to put Devotion up to six. Raptor's going to evolve. It's going to make sure that Thassa's still alive. Things are getting ugly out here. Judge is familiar on the stack. Here's a Doomblade. This might be a Rapid. Oh, no. What yeah. an opening yeah. here for Fyrick. So Rapid's, gonna, Rapid's going to kill the Tidebinder Mage. That's going to come into play. Cloud from Raptor's already in play, so that's going to evolve. So Judge is familiar isn't going to evolve Cloud from Raptor, but Judge is familiar will make it so that there's four Devotion in play. We're not all, we're not all the way there for Thassa. But Chung is definitely way behind on the board at this point, and Fyrek has enough disposable creatures where Desecration Demon does very little work. Yeah. See, Chung draws a Swamp for the turn. Does have Bio Blight, but unfortunately for him, it will not get the job done against the two Judges Familiar, for example, because you just sacrifice yes. one of them, and then they won't be able to kill the other copy. So here's Desecration Demon, as you did mention. Fyrek immediately draws. This is going to be a Master Ways. That's the last card in his hand. Devotion is fulfilled now. You see him counting. It's going to be for five. And now, as you mentioned, he can control the Desecration Demon. Yeah, I mean, I, I felt like Fyrek had enough tools to control it before. He certainly has more than enough tools to control it now. Yep. Cloud Raptor is going to evolve. You see Demon Trigger on the stack. Sacrifice an Elemental. Come across here for five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. This is a good draw from Mono Blue Devotion. You rarely see the Mono Blue Devotion deck win like this in post board games yeah. here, because it sets up for a much grindier game. But if you draw one, two, three, the three being Thassa, and you know your opponent does nothing on one and nothing on two, it's going to be good enough. It looks like this game, it's going to be as Fyrek has a beautiful board right now. Chung with just a Desecration Demon, which he cannot really use productively. Yeah, I think the key against Mono Black Devotion is just you need to get out on front of the board fast. Yeah. Because it's not actually the most mana efficient deck. It, it plans on exhausting your resources, but it, it regularly can only cast one spell a turn. Mm -hmm. And so when it passes through turns one and turns two without doing anything, uh, sometimes it can't catch up with cards like Desecration Demon and Great Merchant. You're seeing exactly that kind of game right now. Yeah, those feel like, th that has to feel like a win for you, especially when you're on the play too. Uh, when you play a one drop, two drop, and your opponent doesn't do anything until turn three and their turn three is Doomblade by 2-2 Grizzly Bear, like, you just have to be thrilled. Yeah, this is why I mentioned, you know, I felt like Chung needed to do something on turn two. Mm -hmm. He had Doomblade and Bio Blight, cast neither, and now it looks very likely that he's going to die with one of his removal spells in his hand. Yeah. As you mentioned, don't be too proud. Just do it on something. Don't be too proud to take down the Judge's Familiar. It's gonna be a Bio Blight targeting Master of Waves. See if we got any responses here or anything of that nature. And these judges' familiars are going to cause a lot of contorting for, for Chung as well. For sure. You see Fyrex considering using one of these right now to maybe make him pay a little more, potentially two of them. Yeah, because there's nothing the Mono Black Devotion deck can really do with one mana mm -hmm. left over. And so you tap him out here, you know that you're almost in the clear to do whatever you want. Yeah. And so he's going to do this again. It's a really good play by Fyrex. Yeah. Because it'd be very easy just to leave the Flyers in play. I'm so close to Devotion. All I need is one more blue, and I can attack and do these different things. But instead, he's really contorting the mana of Chung and making him make a very difficult decision. Yeah, this is essentially leaving Chung dead on board as the Raptor can be sacrificed to the Demon and the Frog Lizard can come across for lethal, even if Fyrick adds nothing to his board this turn. So now that other Judge's Familiar is on the stack, I believe, and I think Chung is deciding if he wants to pay for it or not, considering the ramifications of what, he, of what happens if he does. 
Yeah, Chung might actually have to let it go just to keep up appearances. Yeah. To make it seem like there's something he can do. He's going to pay the one. So Master Waves and the Elemental Tokens are going to go bye-bye. And the tough thing here is he's hard to play land for the turn, because last turn was Desecration Demon. Right. So this turn was land, play Bob Blade, pass. Now he has to pass back, maybe hope for a bit of a mistake here. It's time for Fyrek to scry. Yeah, Chung didn't even leave up the Swamp. He left up the Muta Vault, so yep. the coast is absolutely clear. Fyrek is going to draw. He's going to play Claustrophobia. Sure. Yeah, that'll do it, too. An attack with everybody. And that is it. Matthew Fyrek is going to move on to 7 and 0 oh with Mono Blue Devotion, defeating Matthew Chung, playing Mono Black Devotion. So, Mono Blue has been kind of off the map a little bit, but 7 and 0 oh right now. And I think, it's, you know, like I said, with all the red decks that are kind of cropping back in, particularly the burn strategies, I think Mono Blue Devotion is really well suited as a metagame call. I agree. I agree. I think, uh, you know, it's. You say it all the time. Metagames are ecosystems. Yep. And, and we are kind of rotating through one right now. Right. And it, it, I am uh, really, I'm not surprised, but I am very happy to see the mono blue build of the deck back as opposed to the blue white builds. Now, there could be some of those floating around the room as well, mm -hmm. for all we know. But uh, I really felt that people went a little bit off the deep end with the number of white cards they were adding and the number of co comes into play tap lands and the removal of rapid hybridization all struck me as too aggressive of a response to Pack Rat and uh, overvaluing Afara a little bit. Okay. And these mono blue lists are, you can see, much more efficient with their mana, much more streamlined, much more aggressive. Yeah, 